to the emergency room, and on the way down, we sort of try to cheer each other up by saying, well, you know, we often get calls that they're bringing in some horrific problem to the emergency room, and it turns out maybe it's not really that bad. So let's hope that's what is the case here. With that, the elevator door came open, and we walked out into what's called the pit area in the emergency room uh, at Parkland Hospital. That area was probably about two-thirds the size of this room here. Uh, and around all sides of that room were uh, patient cubicles for seeing emergency patients that had come into the emergency room at Parkland. And along the rear of that room was a hallway, uh, and on each side of that hallway, off of the pit area, were two emergency operating rooms on one side and two emergency operating rooms on the other side so-called trauma room one and two on one side of the hallway, and trauma room three and four on the other side. Well, what we first saw when we stepped out of the elevator was a room, a pit area, as I just told you how big, that was jammed completely with men in business suits, all wearing fedora hats. Everybody wore hats back in those days. I think people would rather go out side without their pants rather than without a hat at that time. But that just struck me that that was, you know, what I saw there. That, and it was literally jammed shoulder to shoulder with people. And uh, as we took that in, Dr. Crenshaw and I stood there, uh, and the crowd, that crowd of men, parted spontaneously so that there was a little corridor down which we could see to where those rooms were uh, those operating rooms, emergency operating rooms, on that little hallway, you know, a holding chair in her bloody clothing. And I thought to myself, uh, this is exactly what they said it was. And I literally had to force myself to walk down uh, toward where she was sitting. At that time, our surgery faculty consisted of four people. Dr. Shires, my chief of surgery, whom I knew, who I knew was in Galveston at a medical meeting at that time, so he wasn't there. My two associates, Dr. Malcolm Perry and Dr. Charlie Baxter, I thought at that time, this was about noon, were probably outside of the Parkland uh, at one of the hamburger joints along Harry Hines trying to avoid the Parkland food, which was <laughs> good to do if you could. So what did that mean? That meant that I was it, that I was the quote-unquote senior only that's hardly an appropriate name to apply to me then, surgeon. And I walked down toward where Mrs. Kennedy was sitting, and Mrs. Doris Nelson was standing by the doorway into that hallway between two secret service men. She was letting them know who to go, go by and who not to go by. So they waved me on through, and um, I pushed the door to trauma room one open and uh, was greeted with a horrific sight that's probably etched in my memory right to this day. And that was uh, uh, President Kennedy lying on a cart, a wheeled cart, what we call a gurney, uh, face up uh, mm -hmm. with his face toward the door and a bright operating room light shining on his face and his bloody head. And that was what I saw. That my two associates, Dr. Perry and Dr. Baxter, had just a minute before come into the room right before me. And Dr. Perry was uh, about to uh, explore a wound that he had seen in the president's neck. And as I walked by the, uh, the cart that the president was lying on, Dr. Perry reached across uh, the president and handed me a surgical retractor. And he said, Bob, would you go stand at the head of the cart and lean over and hold a retractor in this exploratory wound that Charlie and I are about to make. We're concerned that he's had some injury to his carotid artery. Mm -hmm. What he had uh, is a wound about the size of the end of my finger, just about here where his tie would be, and just above his collarbone and just to the right of his windpipe. Small wound, but it was near where the carotid artery would be. And so they were going to look at that wound and see if there was any carotid artery injury. He was, uh, of course, completely unconscious. He had come into the emergency room, and the very first physician who saw him was Dr. James Carrico, who was a first-year surgery resident uh, on duty all the time 
uh, in the emergency room. And so he also heard that the president was coming in and was then standing by the rear door of the emergency room um, awaiting the president uh, with a laryngoscope ready and an endotracheal tube ready. So that when the door was pushed open with the president's body on the cart, uh, he immediately uh, took the laryngoscope and inserted an endotracheal tube into the president's windpipe so it could be connected to a breathing machine. And that's what was done after he was brought into trauma room one. He was immediately connected to an anesthesia breathing machine. And Dr. Jenkins, our professor of uh, anesthesiology at that time, came down and worked uh, that machine while we were doing the exploration of the president's head of the gurney, leaning over to hold a retractor in the exploratory wound that was being made to explore this smaller wound in his neck. Dr. Baxter was on one side and Dr. Perry was on the other side. Uh, and was making the incision in his neck straight across where you would put in a tracheostomy. Some people have said that's what we were doing, is making that uh, exploration to put in a tracheostomy. Well, we did put in a tracheostomy, but that's not why it was done. It was done to examine that blood vessel that I mentioned. Well, when I got to the head of the uh, cart and leaned over, uh, to put the retractor in the incision that Dr. Perry was making in the president's neck, the first thing that I saw was a monstrous hole in the back of the president's head. And I said to my two associates, I said, have you seen this wound in the back of his head? And they said, no, we haven't had a chance. We just walked in here before you did. And I said, well, on the right side of the back of his head, uh, where I'm placing my hand, mm -hmm. there's a hole that's probably five or so inches in diameter. And I could actually look down inside the president's skull and see that the uh, back half of his right cerebral hemisphere had been blown out completely. In fact, Dr. Jenkins told me that Mrs. Kennedy had come into the room just a little bit before I, all of this I described holding a good clump of the president's brain in her hand and handed it to Dr. Jenkins. So while I was standing there, a, a large half of his uh, cerebellum also fell from a hole. The reason I'm giving that maybe excessive description, it might sound, uh, is that that is necessary to do that, to place that wound where it was uh, in his hand. Some of the official pictures of that wound show a wound in the back of the head, but more far, farther forward. It was not farther forward. It was way in the back of the head, as if you might expect, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, and a wound that had been caused by a bullet fired from the front. So that's where we were at that point, and Dr. Perry and Dr. Baxter um, completed that uh, exploration of the wound and put a tracheostomy tube in and uh, by this time, uh, trauma room one was jammed with people who had surged into the room to see what was going on. And Dr. Clark, who was our professor of neurosurgery, uh, had come in and was standing by the electrocardiographic monitor that had been attached to the president when he came in. He had good cardiac activity while we were doing the exploration and had been making even attempts to breathe, although Dr. Jenkins was doing that for him at the time we were doing the exploration. Well, about six or seven minutes into that exploration that was being done, Dr. Clark looked at the um, straight line that had appeared on the electrocardiographic monitor and said to Dr. Perry, he said, Mac, you can stop now, he's gone. And so that was Dr. Clark who pronounce the president dead, and he's the one that's usually uh, said to be the one, the physician, who pronounced the president dead. Dr. Baxter and I, though, were caught between the cart that the president was lying on and the wall of trauma room one. The crowd surging out sort of pushed us and the cart against the wall, and we couldn't get out with the big crowd that was leaving. So we just stood there. And then after the rest of the crowd got out, Dr. Baxter and I began to push the cart away from us so we could leave. But before we could do that, the door to trauma room one came open and a priest came in. Uh, we later found out it was Father Huber. And uh, he came over uh, to the president's head. Dr. Baxter and I were still standing next to the 
president, uh, and walked in where we were sitting down at, in the nurse's station. And he said that he had been sitting in his office uh, down uh, adjacent to the emergency room in Parkland. Uh, and that office faced through a window on a long corridor uh, that went from the uh, emergency room area out to the loading dock where an ambulance had been pulled up to take the president back to Air Force One out at Love Field and then back to uh, Washington. Well, Dr. Rose said that he didn't want to do it, but that nevertheless he was required, he thought, to let them know uh, what the law was here in Texas about people who had been murdered. So he got up, uh, having seen this procession of people through the window in his office out onto this car, he saw the, um, the gurney, the cart that the president had been treated on in trauma room one. Only now, uh, the president had been placed in a large bronze ornate coffin that had been brought out to Parkland Hospital to the emergency room by the O'Neill Funeral Home. And uh, that procession of people was being led by the two Secret Service men that I mentioned who waved us on through into the emergency room uh, operating area. And one of them was carrying a Thompson submachine gun. Walking along on the left side of the gurney, Dr. Rose said, uh, was Mrs. Kennedy. On the other side of the gurney were several friends of the president who had come down with him from Washington. Uh, Kenny O'Donnell and Dan Powers and some of the other friends that he was very close to. And so that was a group of people who were taking the president's body out along that corridor next to Dr. Rose's office to the ambulance to be taken back to Love Field. Dr. Rose said he stepped out in front of that little procession and asked them to stop. He said that he needed, he was required legally to tell them what the law was in Texas, and that was that anybody who was murdered uh, had to undergo uh, an official inquest in this state. Well, having said that, uh, Dr. Rose said nobody said anything. They stopped, listened to him, and the Secret Service man, he said, who was unencumbered by the Thompson submachine gun, walked over to Dr. Rose, put his hands underneath his armpits, lifted him up off the ground, and set him over against the wall of the car, and shook his finger in his face, and didn't say anything, but turned away, and they proceeded on out to the ambulance. They had no intention, needless to say, of leaving the president here in Texas for a postmortem or anything else. So they did take him back uh, from Love Field on Air Force One, and he had a postmortem performed that evening at the Naval Hospital. So that's what happened um, at Parkland in the care of the president. 